Hey everybody, it's Lon Seib and it's time once again for your weekly wrap up and this week we're going to talk more about my Comcast Gigabit Pro installation because now I got fiber. It's in the house. I'm going to show you what they did last week. Let's get to it. Now just to recap where we last left off on this, I am getting the Comcast Gigabit Pro service installed here at the house. This is a fiber optic to the home product from Comcast, and it essentially delivers to your residence an enterprise level Metro ethernet connection into Comcast network. It is giving me a total of three gigabits per second of symmetrical bandwidth. Uh, it's way more than I needed, but there's not much else in between what I have now and what they're uh, bringing in with this service where I live. So my maximum connection speed here in the neighborhood is 400 megabits down and 12 up. There's nothing better than what I currently have and I couldn't get anything better than that. In some markets, Comcast offers coaxial gigabit service, which is just called Comcast Gig, uh, and that service would give you a gigabit down and 35 megabits per second up. I probably would have opted for that if it was available, but it was not here. So I was able to convince Comcast after a lot of back and forth to install the service and hopefully get me up to speed here. Now this is going to cost a lot more than my current connection. It's about $320 a month. I had to agree to a multi-year term on this one and I have to pay about $1,000 for installation. So this is not for the faint of heart here, but my connection currently is so bad that I need to do this because I want to switch this channel to 4K and start having higher resolution videos. I've been unable to reliably live stream out of here because my upstream connection is so unstable and they just have not been able to fix it. So hopefully this will finally resolve everything and I'll have a lot of bandwidth now to play with. It's going to be delivering a gigabit symmetrical connection over an ethernet connector in the switch that they're hooking up. And there's going to be a second two gigabit per second symmetrical connection on an SFP plus connector that will be part of that same switch. So it's going to be a lot of fun here to go from not having enough bandwidth to having more than I know what to do with. And part of what we're going to be doing in the course of this installation is talking about the home networking changes that I have to make to be able to take advantage of the full speed. So there's a lot to this and I'm excited to uh, have you join me on the journey here. Now last week I showed you how they were bringing the fiber optic cable from the pole in front of my driveway to the end of the road. I have some of the extra cable now here. This is what it looks like. So they ran a cable with 24 fiber optic strands from here to the end of the street. But the connection that I have is only going to use one or two of those. So when you hear people talk about dark fiber, that's often what you got here. You have strands that are available, but just not in use. And if you look at it from Comcast's perspective, it costs them pretty much the same to run one strand of fiber versus 24. So why not have some extra capacity out there for later if you need it? In this case, it's a very short run of cable, but nonetheless, there are a bunch of houses on the road that might take advantage of it at some point in the future, or perhaps something can get damaged. So it's good to have the extra there. And then what they did is they spooled up the cable at both ends. So when the splicer comes, he could get everything connected. So on the right there is the pole in front of the house. On the left is the pole at the end of the road where there's a fiber splice box. And that's where they tie me into the rest of the network. And then late last week, a whole a bunch of trucks showed up here to pull the cable under my driveway because I have underground conduit that runs from that pole that you can see there under my driveway and it has to go all the way to the back of my property because I share my driveway with two other homes. So what they have is power, phone, and cable going under this driveway here to a midpoint that is right there. And at that Comcast box at the midpoint, there are three uh, pieces of conduit that run out to each home. So the cable currently comes in and then gets split and then gets run out to each house through its own conduit. And for me, that requires the cable to go out and then most of the way back. Uh, surprisingly, the process of pulling the cable was a very manual one. Uh, so what they're doing here is pushing down the apparatus that they use to pull the cable through. So they ran it all the way out to that midpoint. And they also had one that they ran over to the house and they pulled the cable from the house to the midpoint and then back out to the street again and that was uh, using the existing conduit. So they were able to put this fiber optic cable right next to the existing coax service. And then after all that was over with, we got a nice big cable 
uh, brought into the house, and I've got that one here. This one's a little different than the one they put out on the street because they don't need as many fibers here. Again, I'm only using two inside the house. Um, so they ran a six strand cable, so it's a little flatter and a little easier for them to work with, but it's still very rigid. Uh, and they were saying that likely the most challenging part of this is not the fiber pull, but getting it into the house. And for me, it was fortunate that they just had to run it to the basement. So it was a very short run and they were able to get the cable in here without breaking any fibers. Because if you bend this stuff, it breaks. Uh, so you have to be very careful with it. Uh, the cable itself is pretty neat though. This is what it looks like here. And what was surprising to me was just how small uh, these little fibers are. And, and again, I'm just using two of these out to the pole, and that's to get three gigabits of data. You could probably get a lot more uh, out of just one of these little fiber strands. It's pretty amazing how small this stuff is. And the cable actually has a lot to it. So you've got the outer sheathing here. Uh, then you have these two really hard, I think they're plastic uh, members there that give it its rigidity. And then the fibers are protected inside of this sheath here, and they have some lubrication there that I was wearing gloves for because it was getting all over my hands. And then the fiber splicer came in with a little box here to terminate everything. So there are six connectors there, one for each of the strands of fiber that they ran to the pole. Again, we're not using all of them. And what he had to do here was just get the cable prepped for that procedure. So he was able to uh, get that cable from the street all taken apart. And then the process of splicing the cable began. And I'd never witnessed fiber splicing before, and that was really interesting to me. So to some extent, it's kind of like any other kind of wire job here. So you can see he's pulling off the uh, sheathing around the uh, fiber optic cable to expose the glass. He cleans it. Uh, he then puts it into this little cleaver device to get it a nice clean cut. And from there, he puts it inside of his fusion splicing machine. And these can be very expensive for the good ones. And I would imagine this takes a lot of skill to get right, because you really have to position everything properly. The machine does a lot of work, but you still have to get the wire put in correctly and aligned properly. And what surprised me about this whole process was the fact that uh, they're doing this by fusing two ends of these cables together as opposed to wrapping them around each other or something like that. And you can see just how tiny everything is. And the machine actually brings those two ends together and splices them perfectly so the uh, light can just travel right through them. And here you can see the machine getting everything aligned. It gets the core of those fiber optic cables uh, right in the right spot. And then once that screen goes uh, white, essentially, it's going to start doing its fusing process. There you go. And then when it's done, it shows you how well it did. Pretty remarkable stuff here. Uh, once he was done with that, he had some uh, heat shrink uh, that he puts over it, and he drops it into that little thing to seal it up. And he said that once that part is done, it is pretty much uh, a, a single cable. You can pull on it, he said. You don't want to do that, but if you did, it wouldn't be the end of the world. And then after he was done with all of that, we tested the two strands that were going out to the road, and everything seemed to be... Uh, good to go all the way back to the Comcast equipment. And again, we're just waiting on the Comcast component to uh, come in here to get the rest of this job completed. And that process took about 30 seconds or so, and he was shooting lasers all the way down the wire to uh, the other end, wherever that is. Now, the splicer connected the cable inside the house to the street cable uh, here on the pole inside of that canister. And he said the canister is a CWDM, which is a fiber optic multiplexer. Now, inside the house, I've got one strand of fiber for receiving data and another one for sending it. And I have a feeling that when it gets to this box, it gets consolidated into a single strand with send and receive at different optical wavelengths. And I think that's what the CWDM does. If I'm wrong, let me know down in the comment section below but you can have different wavelengths of light on the same strand of fiber to make things more efficient. And I'm pretty sure that's what that box is doing. Now, the next step, of course, as I mentioned, is to get Comcast in here to fully activate the service. So although I have the fiber terminated right now, basically all the way back to wherever I'm plugged into inside of the Comcast network, I don't yet have a way to interface that fiber optic cabling into my network. So they bring over next this uh, big beefy switch that will get us all interconnected. And what I'll be doing is running an SFP cable, SFP plus uh, cable from the Comcast switch into 
my router here and then I'll be good to go. And I haven't yet figured out what I'm going to do with the other gigabit connection at the moment. Uh, last week I told you that I should be able to use both on my existing router, the UDM Pro from Unify, but unfortunately right now it only allows me to use the Ethernet as a failover and not in addition to. So I'll have to figure out some other thing we can do with that secondary connection once everything gets set up. But it is nice to have a problem like this where I have too much bandwidth as opposed to not enough. So that is the update on the cable installation. We are almost there, and as soon as this gets done, I'll do a full review of the service and let you know what I think about it. Uh, everyone that I've talked to that has it uh, is very pleased with it, and we had an interview about two or three weeks ago with somebody who's been running it for about a year or so, and he's very, very satisfied with what they installed at his place. So more to come. Stay tuned. It's a very exciting time for me because I can finally solve a problem that's been bugging me for a long time. Now, this week's wrap-up is being brought to you by all of you. We had a super chatter on one of our live streams this week. That was Travis Rhodes. I want to thank him for his contribution. And we also have a new member on our donor box page. That was Gary Chafin. So I want to thank Gary and Travis for their contributions this week and everyone who's been contributing on an ongoing basis. And I also want to thank everyone who watches on an ongoing basis too because all of those things, of course, equal channel growth. And if you want to support the channel, you can. You can go to lon.tv support and make a monthly or a one-time contribution to the channel. We also support Patreon and, of course, the YouTube membership program, which you can join just by clicking the blue Join button down below. You also get a pretty cool loyalty badge next to your name as well. Now, this week on the channel, we had two live streams. We did our first experiment where we were streaming live here on YouTube and Amazon and offering the Amazon viewers a coupon code to save some money on a product that we were talking about. And that, of course, was some wise stuff. We had the door lock, the plugs, and their bulbs. And I saw a bunch of you took advantage of that offer, so that was a fun experiment. We'll probably do some more like that in the future. And then I also did an Amazon-only stream just because I kind of put it together at the very last minute and it's easier to set up Amazon streams than YouTube streams. Uh, and I was doing a stream while I was recording my video about Xbox Cloud Gaming. Typically, I will not do it only on Amazon. I like to have it in both uh, YouTube and Amazon when I do these, but the other night it just was easier <laughs> to do the Amazon-only one. But if you want to see that full stream, I will upload it at some point and put it into the live stream playlist so you don't miss it and uh, be on the lookout for more in the near future. We didn't do anything on the Extras channel this week. It was kind of a disruptive week with all the work going on around the fiber optic installation and some other stuff that I had to deal with, nothing bad, just pains in the butt kind of stuff. Uh, but we did get a lot of reviews done on the main channel. We looked at the 8-BitDo SN30 Pro controller for Xbox Cloud Gaming, a nice controller from 8-BitDo, but it doesn't work with the Xbox console. Uh, but you can check out the full review and see what it's used for. And then we had the video of that Xbox cloud gaming thing that we did on the live stream. And you can see how the live streams go from two hours to about 13 minutes once we edit everything together. So you can check that one out in the master playlist down below. And we reviewed the Lenovo Legion 7i gaming laptop, a really nice flagship from Lenovo. It's the upgrade from the one that I bought last year. And you can see, again, all of that stuff down below in the master playlist. So this week, we got a couple of fun things planned. The big project I'm going to be working on is speeding up the home network now that my internet connection is getting faster. Uh, so right now, I've got a one gigabit Ethernet network around the house, which is fine for the current connection. But the new connection, of course, runs at two gigabits. So we have to put in faster equipment to get us to that point. Uh, the challenge I have is that I only have Cat5e wiring. But you should be able to work with the existing Cat5e wiring, provided you're not going over too far of a distance. So what I did is I picked up a QNAP switch the other day that is perfect for one of the rooms in my house. It's got four 10 gig ports on it that you can see there, and you have a choice between using SFP Plus or uh, regular ethernet. And then it has eight one gig ports. So what I can do is hook up my gaming PC and my, my other little laptop docking station up there in that room over the 10 gig, run another 10 gig connection downstairs to the basement, and then plug in the slower devices into uh, the gigabit ports on that. I can kind of get the best of both worlds and have a nice fat 10 gig pipe going downstairs. So that's going to be a fun one to play with. Uh, that's a managed switch. It's only 300 bucks. And if I can't sustain 10 gigs over that Cat5e connection, I can turn down that connector to five or two and a half gigs and see exactly what works best. So that's going to be a fun one to play around with. Uh, worst comes to worst, I'll just run some fiber upstairs, a little short patch cable and 
run SFP plus directly if I run into trouble. But I'll keep you posted as to how that works when we get everything going. And then the little switch down there at the bottom is a five port 2.5 gig unmanaged switch that they're selling for $99. And I'm going to put that one uh, in another portion of my home where I don't need the full 10 gigs, but I certainly want to get uh, beyond just one. So I'll be uh, setting up both of those and testing them in an upcoming review. And I think they also let me borrow one of their 2.5 gig NAS devices. So maybe we'll do something with that uh, at some point this week or next as well. Uh, we're also going to have my monthly sponsored video from Plex. They've added some changes, good ones, to their commercial skip feature for the DVR. We'll look at that. And then we're also hopefully, we'll see where I'm at on time at the end of the week here, is finally get my review of the Shadow game streaming service out of the way because we've been looking at all these other game streaming services and this one is really neat because you get a Windows 10 PC that you can boot up in the cloud and put whatever you want on it and it's fairly reasonably priced for what you're getting as well. So we'll be looking at that one and seeing all the different things you can do with it beyond game streaming. Now if you want to be notified every time I go live or do anything on this channel, you can click on the bell to get those notifications. We have other channels that you can find me on here, including my Amazon page at lon.tv slash Amazon shop. And if you follow me there, you'll be notified when I go live on Amazon as well. If you want to engage with the channel, you can sign up for my email list that we use very infrequently. I'll probably let you know the next time we have one of those deal live streams coming up. We have the Facebook group, which is growing every day. And it's a great place to connect with me and other viewers of the channel at lon.tv slash Facebook group. And then we have my store at lon.tv slash store where we sell previously used items that we reviewed here on the channel for prices lower than what they are new. There is only one of everything though because it is just the exact item that was on this table when we reviewed it. And if you want to be notified every time we add something to the store, you can go to lon.tv slash store alert and we send out an email every time something gets added there. I want to thank you all for your uh, continued viewership of the channel. I'm very excited for this new connection. Uh, one of the things I'm going to experiment with is going to a 4K production. All of my cameras can do it. My new vMix computer here can do it as well. So there's no reason not to do it. And we're going to experiment with that as this connection comes online and it'll be a lot easier to send up the much larger video files versus the 1080p we're doing now. That'll just be one of the side benefits of having a real good connection now to work with here. So more to come, stay tuned and I will see you very soon. Until next time, this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Tom Albrecht, Chris Allegretta, Mike Patterson, and Bill Pomerantz. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.